Hey there future college students, my name is Kevin Landry. This is the third video from our playlist of the most common pre-algebra questions that show up on the ACT math section. This particular video is going to focus on fractions. Now before we get started, please do me a quick little favor and subscribe to our channel and be sure to hit the bell notification so that you'll get an update anytime we load a new video. Okay, so this particular video is going to focus purely on fractions from the ACT math test. Now these questions are very common on the ACT math test, but we're going to need to distinguish between the different types of fraction questions that you could see. The ACT likes to test you directly on fractions sometimes, and other times they test you indirectly by embedding fraction skills within more challenging problems. For this video, we're really going to just focus on the simpler fraction problems that they would test you on directly. Now before you watch the remainder of this video, what I'm going to suggest for you to do is to go down in the description below and I have a link to the document that I use in the video. Print the document and give yourself about five minutes to complete the questions. When you finish, come back and watch the remainder of the video to see the explanations on how to work each of the questions and hopefully see a few strategies to help you out as well. Good luck and we'll see you at the end of the video. Jumping into the next set of pre-algebra questions that are commonly show up on the ACT, we move into the area of fractions. Now, what you can understand about fractions is that the ACT will actually give you just basic fraction questions, usually pretty early on. You can expect to see some sort of mixed number or you know, conversion of fractions somewhere in the first 10 to 15 questions. But you also have to keep in mind that fractions are tested indirectly as well. Fractions can be embedded in pretty much any math, as, as you know, if you've made it to your junior or senior year in math. Even if you're just in high school math, you're aware that fractions are pretty much everywhere. And if you don't learn them well at the elementary or middle school level, they can kind of haunt you you know, all the way through your high school math career. So very important that you have good fraction skills. Now we're going to focus on the pre-algebra type fraction questions here. So I've got five common questions that show up pretty regularly on the ACT. So let's go ahead and jump in and let's take a look at this first one. So again, if it's your first time doing any of the videos of this playlist, what we've provided for you is a playlist of all the more common pre-algebra questions that show up on the ACT. I've provided you a document that goes along with each one of these particular videos. My recommendation is to go to the link and print out that document, work the problems before I go through the explanations, and then follow along with me as I explain those. That'll that'll get you the most bang for your buck as far as experience and, and understanding how to work the problems. You'll see your mistakes, you'll recognize your mistakes, and that'll have a better lasting effect of remembering this material. Okay, so this first question says, all of the following fractions are equivalent to two-thirds except, and so of course we've got the word, this extreme word here, except, so we know that only one of them is not going to be equal to two-thirds. Now, this is, you know, very simply, you can use this from a calculator standpoint. You can, if you know how to use your calculator, you can convert from decimals to fractions, fractions to decimals, from mixed numbers to improper fractions, and all these different parts on scientific calculators. Of course, if you're on a TI Inspire or TI-84, you can actually put it in the fraction bar notation, and it'll reduce it for you. So the key is just to get all of these answer choices comparable to each other. So whether you do it by reducing it to a smaller fraction or if you convert everything to a decimal form, basically you're looking for the one oddball. So all four of the given answers are all going to be exactly the same and then one of them is going to be different. So if we go ahead and do this, and, I, and I've used a calculator to kind of help me just reduce things quicker, and, and don't get me wrong, I can do this in my head, but if I'm taking this on a test, 
why take the chance? You've got a calculator. Just verify that what you're thinking is correct. And I know that sometimes you can think faster in your, in your head, and that's perfectly acceptable. But we definitely want to make sure that we're not sacrificing correctness just to go fast. We have to balance those two. So if we're looking at this, this first fraction is going to equal to 2 thirds when reduced. The second fraction is also going to be equal to 2 thirds. And if we just work our way down, we can see all the way down until the very, very end, everything is equal to 2 thirds. And of course, if you're looking at this from a decimal standpoint, you got 0.666 repeating, whereas down here, you would have gotten 0.333 repeating. And so that would have been the telltale sign, either decimal or fraction. So since we're looking for the one that is not equal to 2 thirds, E is our obvious answer. Now, this is not meant to be difficult. The ACT is just verifying that you understand fractions in general, and then possibly also verifying that you know how to use your calculator to create equivalent fractions. So take advantage of these problems very early on. All right, moving on to the next one. So here we get to a very, very common problem, a mixed number question that tends to show up in the first five questions on the ACT math. It says Shannon walked one and two third miles on Wednesday and two and three fifth miles on Thursday. What was the total distance in miles Shannon walked during those two days? Well, very simply, if we add those two together, we would get our total distance. And very rarely will the ACT give us something where we just simply add two numbers together to get the correct answer. The only way that they're going to allow a question like that is if they're asking you to add fractions that have a different denominator. And you can see here we have a mixed number. So there's a couple things that you need to be aware of from mixed number standpoint. First of all, a mixed number is really can be broken up into an addition problem. So this is the same thing as 1 plus 2 thirds. And this is the same thing as 2 plus 3 fifths. Now, we should know that addition can be reordered in any way that we prefer. So we could actually do this. And then we would just need to create a common denominator. Now, what you end up getting here, and you can use your calculator skills as well. So keep in mind that you have on your calculator, you have the button that has mixed numbers and you could add all this together in your calculator and what you would end up getting is you would end up getting 4 and 4 15. Some of you might be coming up with an answer 3 and 19 over 15 but recognize that we still have an improper fraction here and we would need to take out that whole value of 15 over 15 which would leave us 4 over 15 once we added that one to the to the three so there's a number of different ways that you can do this um, but make sure that you understand what a mixed number actually is now in many cases students would have felt more comfortable with improper fractions and so you could have used your little trick of taking three multiplying it times one and then adding it to two so we would have had five over three and then we would have done the same thing here five times two is 10, 10 plus 3 is 3 over 5. And then from there, we would have had to get a common denominator with the improper fractions and then work our way to the final answer. Now, one of the things that you should be wholly aware of is that if you did change this to an improper fraction type problem, you still got to go back to mixed numbers at some point because you can see here all of the answer choices are mixed numbers. All right, moving on to the next problem. As you can see here, we have a word problem that have fractions in them. And you can count on seeing about 50% of the ACT math is going to be word problems, maybe even more. So you need to get comfortable with this and then converting this to the type of problem that you need to have. So it says, of 804 graduating seniors from a certain high school, approximately two-fifths are going to college. And then out of those two-fifths, approximately one-fourth of those going to college are going to a state university. It says, which of the following is the closest estimate? So notice it's an estimate. We're not going to get an exact answer. We're going to end up with some sort of decimal or fractional answer, but then we're going to estimate which one is the closest. So it says, what's the closest estimate for how many of the graduating seniors are going to the state university? 
So before we can figure out how many seniors are going to a state university, we have to kind of take this in steps. We need to figure out how many of the seniors are actually going to college to begin with. So if I take 804 and multiply it times 2 fifths, and you put that into your calculator, you're going to get approximately 322 seniors are actually going to college. Now, if you'll notice that there is an answer here that says 320, and that's pretty close to 322. That is bait to, to take students who are not really paying attention to what they're trying to find. They see that they're really close to a number. A lot of times students will make the mistake of taking that particular answer choice. But you need to make sure that you understand what the question is asking for. So it says, how many seniors are going to a state university? Well, if we have roughly 322 going to a college and one-fourth of those are going to a state university, that gives me roughly 80 students who are going to a state university, which gives us choice A as the correct answer choice. Okay, again, we have a word problem, so we need to kind of get a good feel of what the word problem is asking for and setting it up correctly. Now, this word problem gets a little bit more challenging than the previous one. And sometimes you got to realize, as a test taker, you don't need to set things up the way your teacher would in the classroom or the way the textbook re recommends it. Sometimes just getting the answer the fastest way possible is the way that you need to do this. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach here and I'm going to take more of a manual approach to this problem. So it says a company builds bridges that builds bridges uses a pile driver to drive a post into the ground. It says a post was driven 18 feet into the ground by the first hit. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of make a note of that. So our first hit went 18 feet into the ground. It says on each hit after the first hit, the post was driven into the ground an additional distance that was two-thirds the distance the post was driven in the previous hit. So let's just go ahead and think about that. Our second hit would be 18 feet and an additional two-thirds. Well, we need to know what that amount is. So it went two-thirds the distance of 18 feet, so that would end up being 12 feet. So we, it says, after a total of four hits, the post was driven how many feet into the ground? Okay, so what I'm going to continue to do is figure out how much further the next hit put it into the ground. So I'm going to take that 12 feet from the second hit and get two-thirds more distance, which would be 8 feet. And then again, that fourth hit, I'm going to take that eight feet and see what two-thirds of that would be. And that would be roughly five and a third feet. Now, what's happened here, it says, after four hits, how, what was the post, how many feet was the post driven into the ground? So we know that it was driven into the ground 18 feet the first hit, 12 feet the second hit, eight more feet the third hit, and five and a third. Excuse me, I wrote five and a fifth here. So that should be five and a third feet on the fourth hit. And so if I were to add all of those together, I would get 43 and a third feet that the post was driven into the ground. And we can see that that is answer choice C. So again, I kind of took this from a manual standpoint. This is a challenging problem, and this is a good example of how a pre-algebra problem testing you on fractions can show up later in the test. This question was somewhere around number 32 to 35 on the actual ACT. It's a much more challenging fraction problem, and even though it's pre-algebra, it can be a little, a little bit more difficult than your adding of mixed numbers. All right, and let's go to our last problem here. Our last problem is going to be more of a conceptual problem and testing your understanding of the way fractions work. So we can see here, it says, which of the following is equivalent to 1 over A plus 1 over B for all non-zero values? So what basically what we're saying is A can't equal to 0, B can't equal to 0. And of course, if you, if you did this and it were 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3, we would want to get a common denominator. And the way we would do that is we would multiply the numerator and denominator of the first fraction by 3 so that we could get 3 over 6. And of course the second one we'd multiply by 2. And the reason I like to use numbers is because a lot of students feel comfortable 
doing common denominators with numbers. However, when we bring that to a fraction that actually has letters in its conceptual, a lot of students get really confused as what to do. Well, basically I'm going to do the exact same thing I did when I had numbers. I have an A, but I don't have a B, so I want to multiply the first fraction by B over B, and I'm going to multiply the second fraction by A over A. And what this is going to give me is it's going to give me B over AB and A over AB, and now I have a common denominator. And so if I look at this, I have a common denominator. Now, I want you to look at the answer choices. If we just look at the answer choices, we can see that A, B, and C don't have A, B as their common denominator. Only D and E actually have a common denominator. And so if I put these two together, notice there's only one A, B. So I'm going to have to put these two together to get one common denominator. So if I'm looking at my answer, and I'm looking at the remaining answer choices that would work for me, I have to pick D or E, and we can see that the B and the A are just written in a different order than part E is, and that's perfectly okay. So E would be our answer in this particular problem. So hopefully that was helpful for you. Five common problems that show up on the ACT math for pre-algebra in relation to fractions. Keep in mind what I said at the beginning of the video. A lot of these fraction problems can show up as indirect knowledge and other more complicated math like trig and geometry. So just keep your keep aware of that. So all right, good luck. We appreciate you watching the video and hopefully you'll stay tuned for the next one. So did the fractions give you any trouble? Let me know in the comments below if the fractions get a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Now keep in mind your fraction skills could be tested five or six times on the ACT math test. Thanks for watching our video. Be sure to keep an eye out for the remainder of the videos in this series. Remember the quickest way to ACT improvement is to practice as many ACT math questions as you can. If you need more practice and strategies to go along with these videos, be sure to check out our ACT online prep course. I have provided a link for you in the description below. We also have plenty of free ACT resources on our website. Be sure to check all those out. Thanks again and we'll see you in the next video.